Welcome everyone. Today we'll be looking at the lesson entitled Rational Functions Day 3. And this of course would represent the culminating piece of our three day set dealing with rational functions. And it picks up exactly where we left off on the previous day, dealing with some of the characteristics and then also sketching the graphs of the functions. So uh, it looks like you have an example one right off the bat there with a couple different, well three different functions to look at. So why don't we go ahead and get started. And so uh, letter A, f of x equals x plus 3 over x squared plus 4x minus 5. And uh, I'm going to sketch the graph of that function on here. I'm not going to point plot at all, but I'm just going to use the characteristics and some reasoning skills to see if I can get a picture of what that graph might look like. All right, so first order of business, everybody. What I want you to do on your paper is let's start with these characteristics. So vertical asymptote or the whole horizontal asymptote or oblique asymptote, and you'll have to excuse my shorthand there, and then the intercepts, y-intercept, and x-intercepts. And so what I want us to do is take a moment and um, see what we can do with these four characteristics, and uh, based on this function right here, see what we can create, and then see how that would translate over on the coordinate plane over here. All right, well, first order of business, when we talk about the vertical asymptote or a whole, we do know from the previous lesson that those come when the function is undefined. And specifically, in a rational function, it occurs when the denominator is zero. So if there is a value of x that's going to make the denominator zero, it's either going to produce a vertical asymptote or a whole. And we talked about the distinction in the previous lesson. So first order of business probably is to go ahead and factor this. And I'm just quickly getting an x plus 5, x minus 1 right there. So I'm just going to put that in underneath. And so what that allows me to figure out right off the bat is that we have two discontinuities of the function, one when x is negative 5 and one when x is positive 1. Now in this particular case, it looks like both of these would be vertical asymptotes because the factors that produce the discontinuity are not in the numerator. So it's up to you how you want to go ahead and do this. I'm just going to write VA x equals negative 5 and x equals positive 1. So two vertical asymptotes, no holes in this particular case. Maybe we'll see them come up in the near future. All right, next order of business is to look at the end behavior of the graph. And uh, that's checking the degree of the numerator compared with the degree of the denominator, and it'll either produce potentially a horizontal asymptote or we've also investigated an oblique asymptote. So I'm visualizing an x to the first on top and then an x to the second down below. So degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. And when that is the case, we do get a horizontal asymptote, of course, of y equals 0. So horizontal asymptote y equals 0 based on the degrees. Okay, next order of business, y-intercept. If you remember from the previous lesson, or just dealing with functions in general, to find the y-intercept of a graph, we put 0 in for x. So I'm going to ask you actually to take a moment. I like doing it from the initial one right here. You could also put it into the factored form if you'd like. But basically, if you put 0 in for x, what do you end up getting for y? And I get, on the numerator, I get positive 3. If I put 0 in for the denominator uh, x, I get negative 5. So positive 3 over negative 5 would be negative 3 fifths. So that's what I'm getting as the y-intercept. Just make sure you're getting that as well. And then last of our characteristics before we sketch this thing, x-intercepts. And if you remember, x-intercepts occur when y is 0. So how do I make y 0 dealing with a fraction? And what we figured out is if the numerator is 0, well, 0 divided by anything will give me a, an answer of 0. So the, the 0 of the numerator will produce the x-intercepts. And real quick, looking at that x plus 3 factor, it looks like I'll get an ordered pair of negative 3 comma 0. So again, that negative 3 coming from the factor of x plus 3 in the numerator. All right. 
Well, let's see what we can come up with here. Again, I don't want to point plot or anything like that. I just want to use these characteristics to get a good sense of what the graph will look like. So let's start. And I'm not even going to put in tick marks. You definitely can. Well, you know what? Actually, I stand corrected. That's probably a good idea. So one, two, three, four, five. Let's get a vertical asymptote there at negative five. And then let's get one at positive one. That's the first order of business there. And behavior. So eventually we'll see the function values approach the y values of zero. So something along those lines. And let's see, it looks like negative three-fifths as the y-intercept, so just about there, just above that negative one. And then lastly, I'm seeing an x-intercept of negative three, so one, two, three, and something like that. All right. So now let's see if we can use some reasoning skills to see what the curves will look like in the three sections. And here's what I would say right off the bat. We have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 5. So what that does tell me is there is going to be a hyperbola somewhere to the left of that vertical asymptote. Part of the curve is going to be in between these two vertical asymptotes, and part of the curve is going to be to the right of this vertical asymptote right here. And so I guess from my vantage point, the only thing that really jumps out at me at least is sort of the middle piece. So it, the curve has to go through these two points. Um, it's got to cross here at negative 3 as opposed to touching, and it's got to come down here, and there are no other x-intercepts or y-intercepts, obviously. So and, you, know, you let me know if this is a, a, a leap too far, but I'm seeing this kind of coming like that. I'm going to just ballpark it for the moment here and then sketch it in. But I don't see any other way really based on the characteristics for that part to look any different. Because it cannot, it's not going to come back this way because it's not a touch here. It's not going to cross and come back because there are no other x-intercepts. So in order for this to occur, I'm, I'm pretty confident that this would be the case. And again, is it absolutely the perfect drawing? Nah, never. But that's, uh, that should do. Okay. Now, as I look at that, so that's taken care of, now I know that the hyperbola, the curve has to be either up here, kind of approaching the two asymptotes, or down here, approaching the two asymptotes. And if you think about it, remember we talked about the multiplicities of vertical asymptotes? And do you notice that x plus 5 is only one factor. There's no squared or anything like that. And what we talked about, what's kind of fascinating, is when it is a single multiplicity of that factor, then the graph approaches the vertical asymptote from two different directions. So like if we were going to infinity on the right side of the asymptote, then it means it needs to go to negative infinity on the left side of the asymptote. And so that tells me it's going to look something like that. And then same order of business here, because there are no intercepts or anything like that. So um, I've got to figure out, is the graph going to look like this, or is it going to look like this? So let's go to our vertical asymptote coming from x minus 1, because that's what produced this guy right here. And notice it's also a single multiplicity. So that tells me that on the left side of the vertical asymptote, if the graph went to negative infinity, then on the right side, it has to go up to positive infinity. Okay, and again, that comes from that first lesson that we looked at. Nice little investigation. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Now, I'm going to just grab the calculator very briefly here and just sketch it and see. Okay, come on, there we go. And so I'm going to go ahead, and it doesn't have to be perfect, as I said. But uh, let's see, I'm going to get uh, parentheses. And you could do this as well. In fact, I'd encourage you to do this. And I'm just going to zoom standard for now. I, I don't even think we really want to change windows or anything like that. You know, it's not ideal. But you can kind of see it, even though it's getting a little convoluted in there. Here's that part, and then here's this part, and then here's that part right there. And the two vertical asymptotes, one at negative 5, 
and one at uh, an X value of positive one. Cool. Again, I could get a better graph on that, but I don't see the need at this point. All right, very good. Let's move on to the next. All right, so uh, the next one, 2x squared minus 10x over x squared plus 3x. Same idea, everybody. If you would, take a very quick moment. Let's go ahead and see what um, is produced here. So same four, basically, y-intercept, and then x-intercepts. All right, now I think it's helpful to kind of write some things in factored form. So just off to the side, I'm going to write the numerator in factored form, and I hope you don't mind me taking the initiative here and just doing it quickly. Factor out the 2x, that looks good. And then the denominator, factor out the x, also looks good. All right, let's see if we can go through this one a little quicker with our characteristics. So two discontinuities coming from the denominator. So a discontinuity at 0 and a discontinuity at negative 3. I see the discontinuity at negative 3 being a vertical asymptote because there's no x plus 3 in the numerator. But I see the discontinuity at 0 being a whole because the factor that produced the discontinuity of 0 is also in the numerator. Hopefully you see that. So as a result, we would say that there is a whole when x is 0. And again, we made that distinction in the last lesson. Please ask about it, though, if it's still not clicking. All right, everybody, horizontal asymptote versus oblique. Degree of uh, the numerator is 2. Degree of the denominator is 2. So we're going to get a horizontal asymptote here because the degrees are the same. And I would look to the leading coefficients, in this case, just 2 over 1. So we should get y equals 2. All right. Next one, everybody, the y-intercept, of course. Y-intercept means we put 0 in for x and solve for y. And don't know if you've already seen this or can figure it out, but if I put 0 in for x, it's going to give me 0 in the numerator, and it's also going to give me 0 in the denominator, which we already kind of knew, right? And so as a result, 0 over 0 is undefined, again, which we kind of knew from the discontinuity right here. So, yeah, I don't see any y-intercept there, of course. And then lastly, x-intercepts. So remember, everybody, they come from the factors of the numerator. The 2 is irrelevant. The x, don't, don't set x to 0 here and try to come up with an x-intercept because, remember, we have a whole when x is 0. So these guys officially kind of cancel in simplified form. So uh, there is no x-intercept when x is 0 because of the discontinuity at that spot. But there should be an x-intercept at positive 5, so I'm going to write that here, 5 comma 0. Awesome. All right, everybody, let's put it in play. So I've got my vertical asymptote at x equals negative 3. I have my horizontal asymptote at y equals 2. I'm going to have a hole when x is 0. We'll figure that out momentarily. I do have a, an x-intercept at 5. And that's unfortunately all we have at this stage because there's no y-intercept because there's going to be a hole when it crosses there. All right, so now we just have to figure out where the curve would lie. And again, there are going to be two parts to it, of course. Here's my vertical asymptote separating. So there's going to be um, part of the curve to the left of the vertical asymptote, part of the curve to the right of the vertical asymptote. So where does it have to be? And the question I guess I would have for you, again, just using some logic, um, is the curve going to look like this? Or is it going to look like this? And the answer has to be the former. It cannot be this one, because if it was this one, we would have had an x-intercept that's shown up uh, somewhere to the left of this vertical asymptote. But no more x-intercepts, of course. So what that tells me is it has to look something like that. Okay, and then which means, again, same idea, 
is it going to look like this, or is it going to look something like this? And based on the fact that it has to cross through that x-intercept, to me it looks like it's going to have to do, be something like that here. Now I'm going to be a little careful with this one because as I draw it, remember there's a hole when x is 0. So I didn't do a great job with my vertical asymptote there, but that's all right. But the key, everybody, is the discontinuity. Remember, a discontinuity is all about the fact that when I draw the graph, I have to pick up my pencil and then draw the remaining part. So there's a hole right there because there's a discontinuity when x is 0, as we figured out. So if I ever ask you to graph something like this, just make sure you don't go all the way through in a continuous fashion. Pick up that pencil and jump over it. So that's why there's a hole. All right. To be honest, I'm not going to bother with the graphing calculator at this stage. I'm pretty confident that we did a nice job with this. If you uh, would like to pause the video for a second and graph this and see how we did based on the uh, characteristics and just using a little logic over here, by all means. But I, I want to honor your time and move on to the next piece. Okay. So, letter C. And let's go right to it. So everybody, vertical asymptote, whole, horizontal, slash oblique, y-intercept, x-intercepts. Let's see what happens. All right, so first order of business, what I would probably do is write things in factored form, just looking at the numerator, just to get it moving along there. That'll be x plus 2 over x minus 2. That's fine. All right, and so um, let's start with where the function is undefined. Anytime you have a factor of just x, you know you're going to have a situation where um, that value is 0. In this case, actually, you know what? Let me write vertical asymptote there for us. But there is going to be certainly a vertical asymptote when x is equal to 0. So let's write that in. So coming from the factor of x, we get a vertical asymptote of x equals 0. Now, horizontal versus oblique. This is a good one. If you notice, the degree of the numerator is one bigger than the degree of the denominator, so no horizontal asymptote, yes to oblique asymptote, which means, everybody, we've got to do the division. Isn't that fun? All right, so I'm going to do the division, just like we've done in the previous lesson. So we're looking for x going into x squared minus 4. I'm going to put a placeholder in just in case old habits die hard. And remember, everybody, we're just looking for y equals mx plus b up here. We don't have to go all the way through. So what I'm looking for is how many times does x go into x squared? And it goes in x times. And when I go ahead and do the multiplication back down, I get that. And subtraction. And I end up getting 0x, which is kind of interesting. You don't need to necessarily put that there, and then the minus 4. So it's like how many times? It doesn't really any, make any sense. You could put a plus 0 here if you want, but it's completely unnecessary. So I, I hope you do realize that there's no non-zero constant on the back. So as a result, my quotient really is just x, and I don't care about the remainder. So I don't mean to rush this in any way. But it looks like at the end of the day, I would just be getting y equals x plus 0, or really just y equals x. Okay, good. We'll put that in play. Y-intercept, everybody. Y-intercept means I put 0 in for x. And if I do that, 0 squared minus 4, I would get negative 4 in the numerator. And I would get 0 in the denominator. Negative 4 divided by 0 is undefined, which, of course, we knew because we had the discontinuity when x is 0 already. And just coincidence that the last two, neither one had a y-intercept. X-intercepts, of course, come from the numerator. That's why I like writing it in factored form, which I already did. And those two factors should produce two x-intercepts one at negative 2, and one at positive 2. All right, I think we're ready. Let's go ahead and put it in. Vertical asymptote, everybody right on that y-axis. Cool. Oblique asymptote, when y equals x. 
right on through there. And let's see, no y-intercept, of course, but two x-intercepts. Here's one at negative 2. Here's one at positive 2. So obviously the graph has to go through those two values. And then, again, just think of that. Here's my vertical asymptote, so I'm going to need to draw part of the curve to the left of it and the other part of the curve to the right of it. What's it going to look like? You know, most likely it's, it's going to be something like this. Or is it going to be something like this? And I hope you would agree that this can't be the case here because that's not going to allow me to get through that, um, that x-intercept. So I am thinking it's got to look something like that right there. And again, notice the end behavior is as x goes to negative infinity, the function values are getting closer and closer to our oblique. That's looking really nice. And again, same part on the right-hand side, is it going to look like that, or is it going to look like that? And I pretty much am probably stating the obvious. We know it has to go through that x-intercept there, and really the most logical way for this all to occur is something along those lines right there. Again, I would encourage you, again, I don't want to take the time to do it, but if you want to go ahead and grab the graphing calculator and just pause the video, throw that in, and see how we did. And notice with these three, no t-charts, no tables, no point plotting, just good old-fashioned, these are the characteristics that we studied. This is the logical conclusion of those visually. That's what I'm looking for for these. Excellent. Well, let's move on to the next piece, everybody. And I'm going to change gears a little bit. So the last example, all three parts, were me giving you the function, you showing me what it looks like graphically with the characteristics, and I'm going to essentially reverse it. So I'm going to give you the characteristics, and you're going to come up with the rational function for it. All right, so let's give it a try here. So I'm going to just go throw my y equals off to the side. You can put it wherever you'd like, of course. So rational function, y in terms of x, or if you want, you could do f of x over here, certainly. And these are the characteristics. And let's see what we can produce. All right, I'm going to start really right at the top here. So vertical asymptotes at x equals 2 and x equals negative 2. And remember, these values come from factors in the denominator. So if I see a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, what that tells me is that came from a factor of x minus 2 in the denominator. And if I see a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2, what that tells me is that came from a factor of x plus 2 in the denominator. Again, just kind of reverse engineering here. That's all it is. Awesome. So vertical asymptotes taken care of very nicely right off the bat. I'm not going to multiply it out. We'll keep it in factored form. Now I'm going to skip the horizontal for just a sec and go right to the x-intercepts because x-intercepts, as we figured out, occur when y is 0, and to get a y value of 0, the numerator has to be 0, and these values come from factors. So very simply, if you have negative 4 as a 0 of the numerator, it had to come from a factor of x plus 4. And if 6 is a numerator 0, essentially, then it has to come from a factor of x minus 6. All right, very good. Now, the only thing we have to take into consideration is the horizontal asymptote of y equals 1. To get a non-zero horizontal asymptote, if you remember, the degree of the numerator has to be the same as the degree of the denominator. Well, I have two linear factors in the numerator, so if I multiplied this out, this would be x squared. Two linear factors of the denominator, so if I multiply that out, that would be x squared. So degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator, so now we just go to the ratio of the leading coefficients, which essentially has to be 1 over 1, and I don't even need to write it, but there's a 1 right there and a 1 right there, and that would do it. I think this one's ready to go. 
All right, not too bad. So they're going to get a little more complicated, but I'm hoping you see that first step. Let's do letter B. So same three characteristics here. Let's go ahead and try it. So here's my Y equals, looking good. And let's start with the basics. To get a vertical asymptote at X equals zero, means it's coming from the denominator. Zero always comes from a factor of just X. So at this stage, um, I'm good. I've got a factor of X in the denominator. That's going to give me this piece at this moment in time. All good. I'm going to skip the horizontal asymptote for the moment and go to the x-intercepts. And again, those values come from factors. So x plus 6 and x minus 3 and lastly x minus 8. Okay, that's good. Now, here's where it gets a little more interesting. We need a horizontal asymptote of y equals 2 thirds. Again, a non-zero horizontal asymptote means that the degrees have to be the same. But if you look, the degree of the numerator is, it's a degree three, right? It would be x cubed if I multiplied it out because I've got three factors. But the denominator is only x to the first. There's only one factor. So right now, everybody, the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. So, and I hope you agree that at some point in time, we need 2 over 3, right? The ratio of the leading coefficients has to be 2 over 3. So I'm going to put that in, but that's not quite right in terms of the overall um, situation. I'm still not going to get this because the degrees are not the same. So the question I have for you is, how can we create a situation where the degrees of the numerator and denominator are the same without introducing more vertical asymptotes down here or anything along those lines. And I don't want holes down here either because um, these have to produce um, x-intercepts. So there are a couple of fixes. There's the quickest one, which is this, multiplicity. So right now, this is just to the first power, right? But if I change the multiplicity on this, meaning I change it, that's a three, by the way. If I do that to the third, do you notice now I'll just get the same value from all three factors of x, so I'm not adding more vertical asymptotes, it's still just x equals zero. But now if you notice the degree of the denominator is three, the degree of the numerator is three, and that works. So by changing the multiplicity of whatever factor you need, you end up getting this without messing up the other two criteria. Really cool. All right, let's go do the next one. Let's see if we can um, continue that idea. All right, I'm going to go through the first parts a little faster. So vertical asymptotes come from these factors. Hope you're in agreement there. So write them all in. Looks good. Uh, crossing at negative 4, so that means, again, multiplicities, everybody. So that means we'll call it a single right now. It had to be an odd multiplicity to have it cross at negative 4, so I'll just leave it to the first. But a touch at positive 7, so again, I might mess around with this a little bit, but that does mean it's an even multiplicity, and right now I'll put it as a squared. Okay, so that's good. I've got... These, uh, the vertical asymptotes, and I've got the intercepts right there. Now let's focus on the horizontal asymptote. I need y equals 0, and that occurs, everybody, when the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. But if you notice, what is the degree of the numerator, everybody? Well, it's got to be a degree 3, right? Because I've got three linear factors. If I asked you to multiply this out, you'd get x cubed. So we've got 1, 2, 3. So degree 3 in the numerator, degree 3 in the denominator. So right now, the degrees are the same. 
So I'm not going to get y equals 0. In fact, I'd probably get y equals 1 at this stage. So the question I have is, how can I get y equals 0 without messing anything up? Well, again, as I alluded to in the last one, if I just change the multiplicity on anything, down on the bottom, now I raise the degree of the denominator, because now it's a degree 4 instead of a degree 3. That's what I want you to see. Now you notice that the degree in the numerator is 3, the degree in the denominator is 4, and those are the conditions that would produce a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. Students always ask me, like, does it matter where you change the multiplicity or changing the degree, essentially? Um, and the answer is no. Could I have put a squared here? Sure. Could I have done even a larger power here? Absolutely. As long as you have the degree of the numerator, smaller than the degree of the denominator. So you can start to see that there are really a, a multitude of answers that you could put in, an infinite number as a matter of fact. All right, hope that's clicking for you. Let's go get this last one, and then we'll do our application to wrap this lesson on up. Ooh, good one here. So vertical asymptotes, none. Horizontals, none. 2x intercepts, fascinating. All right, you know what? Let's start with the x intercepts here because I think those are a little more straightforward. So x minus 2, x minus 5, that's all good. Okay, so now how do we create a rational function with no vertical asymptotes? And I'll give you a hint here. It, it's not a situation with holes. Because, to be honest, it's not going to really be able to, we still need variables down here. Um, so I, there's a way around this without using holes. And here's the thing, we've actually seen this already. So if you kind of look at what we've had previously, these factors produced real number values in the denominator, and hence they produced vertical asymptotes. So what we want to do is create something where it doesn't produce a real number answer, but instead maybe produces an imaginary number answer. So we've seen this a couple times, and again, you'll have to kind of go with me on this. But if I do something like that right there, obviously this works out nicely. It's still a polynomial of degree 2 in the denominator. So it certainly fits now everything as a rational function. But if I said to you, set that to 0 and solve, well, you would get x squared equals negative 1, and you would soon realize that you're starting to not get a real number solution, but you're getting plus or minus i. So you're getting imaginary answers. And that has no effect, obviously, on our domain or vertical asymptotes or anything like that. So this is a great little trick for us to go ahead and produce um, a, a rational function in all its glory without producing any vertical asymptotes. Okay, very nice. And then lastly, just want to make sure we have no horizontal asymptote. So let's check those degrees again, everybody. I hope you're good with me that we have x squared in the numerator. We have x squared in the denominator, because this is in standard form down here. So the degrees are the same, so that's not going to work. In order to get no horizontal asymptote, the degree of the numerator has to be bigger than the degree of the denominator. How can I do that without creating more intercepts or stuff like that? Just change the multiplicity. Now, everybody, do you see this would be a degree 3 in the numerator, degree 2 in the denominator, and we certainly would not have a horizontal asymptote. All right, I hope that works for you. Some good challenging ones. I will make one more comment before we do our application problem. Um, did you notice I didn't give you the fourth characteristic, the y-intercept on any of these? Well, it makes it harder. I think in either the practice or somewhere along the line, you might see one. So um, I would love for you to be try to be a little creative with it and try to think outside the box to get that y-intercept to work in a very particular way. 
even though you and I, during this lesson, did not see that scenario. I still think you can do it. Okay, let's move on to the last piece. So a great little application to kind of wrap this on up here. And um, so this comes in under the heading of optimization. So we're dealing with a cylindrical can where we are trying to optimize the surface area, in this case minimize it, based on a fixed volume. So if you could think of, of the nature of this, I'm going to draw a really lousy cylinder over here. Okay, and that cylinder obviously has a radius and a height. That is an R, by the way, down there. And so the idea behind this is, is very simple. We're trying to minimize the surface area, so the amount of resources used to make this can, given a fixed quantity that needs to go inside the can. So I just picked 12 ounces because that's a, you know, a standard can. Obviously, if you think about just a, a normal pop can or something like that, it's not a perfect cylinder because it's got a few other things going on. But I think for all intents and purposes, this works out pretty nicely. So think about we're trying to get 12 ounces inside this can, and we're trying to use the least amount of resources in order to make the can to fit those 12 um, ounces. All right, so that's going to be our scenario. And a couple of formulas you'll need for this coming from geometry. So the surface area of a can is 2 pi r squared. Those would be the areas of the two circles, top and bottom. And then the lateral area, if you remember again from geometry, is 2 pi rh. Okay, now the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h, and we're going to need that as well. Okay, well, here's what we are going to do. We are going to try to write a function for the surface area of this can in terms of a single variable. So right now, just based on the formula, we have the surface area of the can in terms of the radius and the height. This is what I want to get rid of, everybody. Circle that H. So what we need is a way to replace that. And if you notice, I just kept everything here in centimeters and centimeters squared and centimeters cubed just to keep it all consistent. So a 12-ounce can has about this many cubic centimeters. That's going to be our volume, everybody. So 354.882 equals pi r squared h. Okay. Now, you've probably heard me say this before. If I want to replace that variable then I need to solve for that variable in the other equation. And so if I go ahead and solve for h there, I get 354.882 over pi r squared, and that is equal to h. So now what do we do? We take this expression right here, and we replace the h over here. Now again, just to keep things moving along ever so slightly, when I rewrite this, I get 2 pi r squared, and then I get 2 times pi times r, and then I'm replacing that h with this, 354.882 over pi r squared. Now, if we simplify at least this piece right here, a couple interesting things occur. So I'm going to begin the process of writing 2 pi r squared right over here. Now, if you notice on this end, the pi's cancel, one on top, one on bottom. The r's, well, I have an r on top and an r squared on the bottom. This will cancel with one of these guys, so I should have an r on the bottom. And then the numerator is just going to be 2 times that 354 and change. So at the end of the day, I'm hoping this works for you, but I get 709.764 over R. And notice, if we could go a little further. If we really wanted, we can create a common denominator and put this all as one fraction. We could do that. I'm not going to right now because there's no real need. But I do hope you see one thing. We will have a discontinuity when R is what value, everybody? Well, when R is 0, right? 
And that makes sense. Can the radius of our can be zero? No. So the, the function would get infinitely close to a radius of zero, but never quite um, reach it or cross it or whatever the case may be. Okay, I've got this. So this is a relationship between all of the surface areas of our can in terms of all the radii of the can. Okay, and so let's see the relationship visually. So I'm going to go ahead and do this right over here. Grab your calculator if you would too, because I want you to graph this on the window. So I'm going to type this in. Y is going to represent our surface area. X is going to represent the radius. And so I have 2 pi and then x squared, and then plus 709.764, and divided by x. Now, I'm going to give you the window here to use for this, just to make it a little easier for us. And so, for the radius, we're going to go 0 to 10 centimeters. So, that's this right here, everybody. And for the surface area, I'm going to go 0 to 1,000 square centimeters, so 0 to 1,000, and I'm going to graph it. And what we should see, of course, is our curve coming from the rational function. Notice, it, as this is going up and up and up, it's getting closer to the vertical asymptote of uh, the radius being 0. And you can see what happens here is the radius is really small, the surface area is pretty large. And then it goes down, and we see a minimum. And as the radius gets larger and larger and larger, you see that the surface area starts to increase. So there is an optimal way to construct our can in order to reduce the amount of resources used for it. So let's see what that would be. So we go to second, trace, minimum. And I'm going to go to the left of it. Hit Enter go to the right of it, hit enter, and enter one more time, of course. And we see this is the radius of the can that would produce the smallest surface area possible. Radius, surface area. That's what we did right here, radius, surface area. So let's write them in and wrap this on up here. I get about 3.84 centimeters for the radius of the can. And I think I saw 277.48 square centimeters for the surface area of the can. So in order to see what is the optimal way to construct it, we have a radius for the can. We know what the overall surface area would be and it, as the optimal surface area. The only thing left is what is the height. And again, just to move it along a little bit, do you see we have the radius of 3.84? I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm just going to sketch where you would put it. I would put it right back in here. Just make sure you put parentheses around that pi r squared when you do this. But if you do 354.882 divided by parentheses pi times 3.84 squared, close those parentheses, you do get a height. And if you'd like to do this on your calculator, by all means, I'm going to write in what I got just to honor the time here. And there we have it. So it's a great little application of rational functions using the idea of optimization where I have a fixed volume and I want to minimize the surface area. All right, everyone, thanks so much for, um, uh, for listening and taking good notes on this. Let me know if you have any questions or if anything wasn't crystal clear.